Good evening and welcome to Chasing the Facts. I'm Sam Chase, your host, and with us this evening is Chancellor and Public School Superintendent Dr. Jay Lang. Jay, welcome to the show. Good evening and thank you very much for having me. Oh, it's always a pleasure and we always like to have uh, Jay at the start of the school year just to give us a little preview of uh, what they've been doing over the summer and how that relates to the program going forward. But before we get into that, and as Jay knows because uh, I've had you on the show uh, several times, we usually start off with a little bio, but we'll dispense with that because I think most people in town know you uh, after almost 10 years in, yeah, in the started, position. Yeah, start of year 10. Uh, what I do want to do is take a moment to recognize uh, uh, the award that uh, Jay received from the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents, and I think this is very notable, and I would like Thank to you. make sure that the community uh, knows that, that you have achieved this. So I'll just read the... Uh, press release here. The Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents has awarded Dr. J. Lang, Superintendent of Chelmsford Public Schools, with the 2024 President's Award. The honor was, to, was bestowed upon Dr. Lang during the MASS President's Annual Spring Meeting on Thursday, May 23rd. So congratulations. Thank you very uh, much. I appreciate that. Well, uh, well deserved. And, and the press release goes on to list uh, Jay's uh, credentials, qualifications, and the things that you've done. And I guess I didn't realize it until I'd read this, because time flies, especially yeah. as you get older. Now, you've been here nine years. Yeah, I just completed my ninth year as superintendent. And so this is the uh, start of year 10. Yeah, it was the summer of 2015 uh, when I came to Chelmsford. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we're, we're embarking on year 10, so it does go quick. And as I recall, that was uh, somewhat of an unusual and, and an abbreviated process for bringing you in because normally they go through screening committees and this and that, but you just, as they say, timing is everything. You were just available yeah. at that point and the school committee, and I think they absolutely made the right move. I think they did exactly the right thing. If you've got a really good qualified candidate that might be interested, you you approach that person and just get them in as quickly as you can, and that's what they did. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I, it was certainly like an abridged process. Yeah. Um, you know, I appreciated them uh, reaching out and even uh, mm -hmm. talking about the the, uh, the opportunity at the time, and I think, honestly, it's worked out well for both of us. I very much enjoy um, Chelmsford and being the superintendent here. Uh, it is a great community. It's been very supportive uh, my entire tenure, and uh, I honestly, there's not another district I'd rather be in right now. So this has been a um, um, great part of my life. I enjoy coming, getting up and going to work every day. Um, it is the start of a new school year, which is always mm -hmm. exciting for us, but um, to spend you know 10 years in one community is pretty uh, significant, and I'm happy to have been and able is to it, do is, that. Is that considered normal? Is that a normal tenure for most superintendents? Not really. So I think the average is running somewhere between two and three years right now. In a, in a community, there's a lot of turnover in, uh, in superintendents. Uh -huh. But um, again, I think if it's just, if it's the right uh, community and it's the right fit mm -hmm. um, for both, it has to be for the district as well as the individual. Um, and this has certainly, uh, certainly worked. I think you've had very good, uh, you've had good school boards too, backing mm -hmm. you up. I mean, yeah, excellent uh, school committees. you came from Lowell, which I think is a more politically charged environment. And then we see what happens in some of the other communities around us. Mm. But uh, our school committee seems to understand their role is, is not to actually run the schools. And I think that's a problem right. in some communities. And, you know, and, and, uh, I watch your meetings and uh, I, I have a great deal of respect for the school committee. I think they're all very good people. They have the, yeah. uh, they have, uh, the right intentions as far as the uh, school administration goes. But they allow you to do your job. They do. They're very supportive. And it's been a um, very good... Um, Continuity on mm -hmm. this on the school committee. I definitely like the um, the system in Chelmsford where one or two school committee members basically is up for election or turns over mm -hmm. each year. Um, as you know, in, in Lowell, a three basically year term. it's a three-year yeah. term as well, which is nice. But um, in Lowell, it was every two years mm -hmm. the entire slate could yes. change. It's hard to keep continuity. Yes. So here, if you have one or two at most um, switching, and even the, um, we've we've had members that typically will run for at least two terms. Mm -hmm. So it's nice to be able to work with someone for you know six years. Um, they get to know you, you get to know right. them and their values and how you approach things. But I uh, know they've been very supportive. Um, you know, I think we, if you watch the meetings, I think we have a good relationship as far as um, just being able to, 
kind of converse and talk mm -hmm. through issues. Um, you don't always see that in different districts as well. Sometimes the relationship can be a little more contentious. But um, no, they've they've obviously hired me to uh, be the superintendent for the district. Um, I report to them. I keep them apprised mm -hmm. of what's happening in the district. We regularly report the uh, the activities. But um, they don't get too involved in the day to day operations of the district. They really let me and um, the administrators and the team of teachers and support staff around me um, kind of run the day to day operations of the schools. And I think we we put out a very good product and, mm -hmm. and do a very good job. Well, I, th I think so, and, and I think uh, Chelmsford has certainly fully embraced the, uh, the realignment that occurred several years ago under the Ed Reform mm -hmm. Act, where uh, a lot of the managerial responsibility was pushed down at the school level. Right. Is that an accurate way of characterizing it? Where the principals have a little bit more power and authority to manage their operation than, say, they did 40 years ago. Yeah, it was the Ed Reform Act in 93 that mm -hmm. really changed mm -hmm. um, significantly the day-to-day -day operations and the running of school systems. A lot more control was put into the school building principals, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. kind of being the managers of their uh, buildings. They're not only the educational leaders, but they also get to completely manage the hiring, um, the supervision of their staff if someone does need mm -hmm. to leave uh, the termination process. And that used to actually, pre-Ed Reform, kind of reside oftentimes with school committees. Right. So you would have a uh, superintendent make recommendation to the school committee to For hire individual teachers to hire individuals yeah. within the district and mm -hmm. uh, ed reform kind of changed that some districts obviously uh, struggled a little bit more kind of giving mm -hmm. that control and that power away um, Chelmsford I think has been one that certainly uh, at least the school committees that I've worked with um, have embraced that and um, they want to have a very close working relationship with me but they trust uh, myself as well mm -hmm. as the principals um, to really hire and um, uh, make sure that we're overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the district well, as long as I think that, that that's exactly how it's worked out, just uh, from somebody who's just observed the process over the right. last nine years, uh, as long as we're speaking about uh, collaboration and cooperation, let's talk a little bit about your relationship with the town manager, uh, maybe some of the department heads in the, in the, in the town, and, and how you build upon that and how you work with those folks to, to enhance the... Uh, uh, educational uh, situation here in Chelmsford? Sure. Um, I mean, right from the very um, kind of get-go of me, me coming to Chelmsford, working with Paul and the town's finance team was critical to mm -hmm. really kind of having a successful school system. Um, they had gone through some challenging financial times, and um, I think we worked very um, closely particularly in the early years, um, just reporting, really being able to talk through any issues that were uh, coming. Um, Paul and I do have a very good working relationship. Um, I keep him abreast of things that are happening in the schools. He lets me know if things are happening on the town side. Um, we really are partners in, in putting this um, uh, together. Schools typically are about half the size, if not more, of the mm -hmm. entire town when you look at all the departments, so it's critical that we're on the same page. I think um, John Souser and Darlene, the town accountant, have been very good um, again, kind of partners to work with. And I've been very impressed with the um, public safety um, sector. So um, police mm -hmm. and fire have been excellent to work with. And, um, you know, we have a new uh, police chief, Colin Spence, now. We had worked previously with uh, Jim Spinney when he was the police chief. They have been excellent to, uh, to work with. Gary Ryan's been consistent at the fire department since I've been here. But um, anytime there's an issue or a need, um, you know, I can call them, they can call me, and we can uh, sort things through. I think the other department that we work very heavily with, um, well, actually, I don't want to forget one because just a few years ago, you know, COVID obviously was a oh, very challenging time. Um, Sue Roser in the health department yes. at the time were fantastic to work through. Um, we obviously have a school nursing unit. Um, Peggy Gump is our coordinator for that. Um, but you have to work with the town side departments to make sure that there's kind of consistency and continuity in messaging. Um, so Sue and the health department were excellent. And then probably more recently, because we've been doing a lot of work physically to improve the school buildings, and um, we are looking at a new school building project. Um, DPW has been a, a consistent. Mm -hmm. um, Christine Clancy has come on board um, after uh, Gary Persichetti retired a couple of years back. And Christine and her staff have been uh, excellent to work with as well. So you know, we meet uh, minimally monthly just to mm -hmm. review the different capital projects, what's happening in the schools, um, to make sure that everyone stays, again, on the same page. And when we have those meetings, you know, I'm there, Paul is there. Um, it's, it's not just, you know, certain select staff, but we actually have everyone in the room that needs to hear what's happening, um, make a decision if we need to on something. And that's been um, really working well for us. Well, that's good, and I, th I think that's a very good collaborative way to manage. I know uh, Paul has his uh, staff meetings in, mm -hmm. in town meeting, and I've actually been in town meeting when, when those have occurred. And uh, I'm talking uh, to his direct reports, and I'm sure it's the same thing uh, that you're experiencing in your situation, that uh, 
you know, you may not, you, you know, you're, you're the boss and you're the expert, but you don't see everything. And the input no. that you get right. from that kind of a meeting, and, and it may even be somebody who, who really isn't familiar with the area. It's just mm -hmm. a different set of eyes and a, and a different way of looking at something. And uh, an awful lot of good ideas can come from that kind of a, a management uh, style, I think. Right. Yeah. So right. it's, and uh, I think I would say that both you and the town manager have very similar management styles when it comes to managing organizations. You certainly, uh, and, and certainly the school department, I've noticed over the last 10 years, the quality of leadership that you have under you is, mm -hmm. is, is outstanding. It, it, it really is. And it speaks to your, uh, it speaks to your ability and your skill set as a manager because you want to make sure that you have good, strong, capable people right. under you. And that's right. not always the case. There are some CEOs that deliberately hire weak people because mm -hmm. they don't have the confidence. Right. And no, I intentionally hire people who are more knowledgeable and smarter than I am. That's, in, that's uh, exactly in what you areas. want. Exactly right. And it's really bringing people together yeah. to let them have mm -hmm. their expertise at the table, um, talk things through, because not one person can do everything. But I am blessed to have a very um, kind of seasoned and right. supportive um, admin team that works with us day to day. That has been excellent. I think even in district wide, when we look at our school based leadership teams, um, you know, there's approximately 30 or so individuals mm -hmm. that we kind of consider our district wide admin team um, and it's been a very consistent group um, with the exception of one or two retirements over the last couple of years and that's to be expected mm -hmm. um, it's been very stable you know our building leadership our district leadership um, and again I think that has allowed us to really kind of make some progress mm. on some of the bigger um, projects or initiatives that we've wanted to yeah as far as as far as your staff is concerned um, I mean obviously you have the normal uh, turnover that you would have uh, scheduled retirements and so forth, but right. I don't see a lot of people, younger teachers, leaving the district to go elsewhere. That doesn't seem to be a big problem. I mean, you're going to have some of we that, do. obviously, but... Yeah, you know. and this summer we even, we had a few um, that left the district. I will tell you that it's more um, typically because of um, travel, uh, things along those lines. Right. We had a few teachers relocate, you know, outside of the greater Chelmsford area, mm -hmm. and it just become becomes challenging to, to come back and forth to, um, to work. But um, no, I think we actually do a very good job of retaining staff. Mm -hmm. People really want to work here. Yes. And, uh, and when they do uh, come, they very seldom uh, leave. So we really have not had a big issue with uh, turnover. Our mm -hmm. retention rates are very high. I think what we have been um, seeing is we're also kind of fortunate on the teaching side. Um, we only had about 11 or 12 uh, retirements this, this uh, year. That you sounds know, some, low. Yeah, well, yeah. no, that's been pretty consistent really? for us. But some districts, you know, are trying to fill, you know, 40, 50, mm -hmm. 60 jobs based on retirements. But to have that small of a number of people really does speak to when you do work here and you kind of progress through the system. Um, again, unless there's a pretty significant reason, you're likely not leaving and you're staying for your full career. Um, now, it'll be interesting to see over the next 10 or 15 years um, because the newer teachers that we're attracting to the district, we've had uh, struggles as well as other districts because I think the number of students coming out of the teacher ed prep programs just hasn't been as robust as it had been really? pre-COVID. Yeah, so we're in a, in a similar situation to a lot of other districts really trying to um, attract those teachers mm -hmm. to Chelmsford and then show them this is the place that they want to be long term. Um, we did, a, I think, overall a very good job this year filling the openings that we had. Um, where we have str uh, struggled and, and we um, still continue to market are in some of the really kind of specialty areas. So uh, this year we ended up having um, three um, psychologists retire all at the same time. Mm. So that typically That's doesn't tough. happen. So these individuals had been with the district each 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just very difficult to get, you know, in a good year, you know, one maybe new psychologist coming on board, but to get three is challenging. So um, kind of out of the gates this spring, we made sure we advertised early and we were able to fill two of the three positions um, over the course of the spring and summer. And then it did take us until last week to just secure the third. But, um, you know, it took a little bit longer than I wanted to, but like we were able to attract and, and fill mm -hmm. that third position. Um, we were actually doing a, a very good job when it comes to uh, specialized programs, uh, special education, mm -hmm. things along those lines. Um, we've made good inroads with both uh, UMass Lowell now has a bachelor's undergrad program in education. So we've been um, kind of working some partnerships with them 
to um, be an attractive um, alternative mm -hmm. if students are looking for more of a suburban uh, path to take. And uh, Merrimack has been another good partner of ours. We've uh, participated in their fellowship program for the last number of years where we will actually sponsor um, students in their fifth year or their master's program to come into our district and work. Mm -hmm. And that allows us to see them, for them to see the district, and oftentimes that's a good candidate to hire at the end of their fellowship. Um, so we're really doing a lot of outreach to the local colleges to make sure that we're seen as an attractive um, kind of first uh, venue for teaching. And when the, the not the students, but when the uh, young um, people do come, they do typically like it and they stay. So that's been fortunate for us. Well, that's good. Now, um, can a teacher be hired without a master's degree? I'm a little fuzzy on how that works. I know at some point they have to have it. It's a requirement. Yeah. You can be, uh, you can, uh, be uh, licensed with a bachelor's degree. There okay. are certain different criteria you have to meet. All right. But you could be hired with a bachelor's degree if you have the license, and then you have five years to get your okay. master's degree. Um, a lot of students, if they have the ability, are just staying and getting the master's degree done before entering teaching. Um, it's basically if they do a full year program, they can complete the coursework in a year. Um, I will say, if you have a bachelor's degree and you start teaching and you have to then over the five years go to a part-time school, That's tough. it's a lot because being a first-year teacher, it's, it's a lot of lesson planning and just getting to get acclimated with the students and the curriculum and things like that. So it's one more thing. So we have seen, I would think, um, probably more than half of the candidates are coming in with the master's with the already. Masters. That way um, they don't have to get a master's degree because they already have it and uh, they can really kind of focus on their craft as, mm -hmm. they're, as they're beginning. But you technically can do it either way. Um, and we're open to supporting you know, whatever candidates come our way. If they're the best candidate for the job, um, you know, we'll hire them and we'll support them to get whatever they need to licensure-wise. That's good, that, that, that's very good because I, I mean, I wouldn't want to see people, good candidates excluded simply because they did not have the advanced degree. So I think no, that, the that's, that's the right Yeah, approach. the credential is the, the teacher's test. They have to take the MPL right. test. But right. if based on their background, they were able to get that and to get um, a mm -hmm. provisional or initial license, then um, they don't necessarily need the, um, the master's degree that's to at least good. start. So uh, last year, uh, we had a realignment, a uh, middle right. school realignment. And so we've had that. Uh, uh, has been ongoing for a year and we started again this year. Correct. And I've got grandchildren in, in that program, so just as, a, as an interested observer with sure. grandchildren in the system, it seems to have worked quite well. I mean, those, uh, obviously, whenever you make a change like that, redistribute your right. you know, people hate change. Right, right. And it's tough. And uh, so, uh, in your opinion, has that worked uh, up to the expectation, or are there things that need to be tweaked? Or uh... no, I'm actually very pleased with where it is at this point, um, and that was a huge undertaking. Oh, absolutely. You know, uh, I think one of the reasons it went relatively smoothly is we did spend about a year and a half ahead of time mm -hmm. working with um, primarily parents uh, because we knew the students would be changing. But parents of uh, upper elementary and middle mm -hmm. school age um, children. We did um, last year actually talk to the kids that would be affected, and we got their opinions on, on implementation. Um, and then the teaching staff, obviously, and the staff in the buildings um, had to be engaged in the discussion because it was going to be a big uh, change. Um, I do think it actually worked um, very well. Obviously, there were always going to be um, hiccups in the road that have to be approached. And part of the thing that we're doing now with the two schools is you do have new staff together, you have new kids together. Um, you need to build a new culture because, you know, mm -hmm. one just doesn't come without the other. So it is going to take, you know, three to five years to really fully um, implement the different systems and figuring out what really worked well at one school that we might want to replicate at the other. What did someone try that just didn't work and we want to try something different. So I think everyone has gone into it with an open mind. Um, we obviously uh, looked at that merger to help us short term with some of our enrollment uh, needs, but it also helps to inform the larger project, hopefully the new middle school project that we would look at, mm -hmm. because having the grades five and six students all in the same building um, allowed us to then consider doing, um, it just in an easier time frame, a new potential grade four, five, six middle school, which helps with, with enrollment issues at the elementary level as well as the middle school level. Right. So uh, I think overall it was very worthwhile. I'm very pleased with, with you, how it's have, gone. You have pods at all the elementary schools, right? <clears throat> we do. We actually, yeah. we, in 2017, uh, that was one okay. of the first things we had to do. We wanted to not only uh, be able to implement full day kindergarten, which mm -hmm. um, we were able to do at that time. Uh, and that had been something the community really wanted for years. And if you think about it. Timing is everything. That was the year that my oldest granddaughter would 
scheduled to start kindergarten. Oh, really? So, so she got in right on the first level. I remember my daughter, thank God, we're doing full yeah, kindergarten. But again, that was yeah. a huge lift as well. Oh. And that kind of went off seamlessly. You know, it opened up. Obviously, you're going to again, have your little hiccups. And, you and have not to everybody through. was in favor of that, which kind of no. uh, surprised me a little bit, you yeah. know. I, uh, I think at this point, <clears throat> it's just the norm in oh, communities. Sure, yes. We were one of the holdouts that didn't right. have that. But um, we did add the 22 module, uh, modular mm -hmm. classrooms in the four different elementary schools. Again, half to kind of help with the full day kindergarten implementation, mm -hmm. and the other half was to deal with some of our enrollment right. in the short term. Uh, but we're still looking out over the next 10 years. Um, we do through turnover of housing stock in the community mm -hmm. as well as some new development in the community. We're anticipating about another 600 kids joining the school system. And we just don't have the physical space for that right now. And if, you had, if, if that statement had been made 10 years ago, people would have declared you insane because mm -hmm. it didn't look that that's the way it was going to go. Right. So in your opinion, what has happened? I mean... Well, uh, a couple of different things. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things that we're definitely seeing because um, we get to see when the kids come in to register with their families, the addresses that they're enrolling from, and we're seeing a significant number of... Um, older, bigger houses that maybe had um, a family in them that has kind of progressed on and it's just left, say, a grandparent in the house. Some of them are downsizing because um, okay. we're seeing them leave the house and if it's a three or four bedroom, there's a new family Younger coming in now with in. kids. Um, so that has been a big uptick because we can look at the address where they're registering from and we may not have had any kids enrolled at that address for 20 or 25 years, but all of a sudden now we have a family of four or five um, kids coming from an address. So there has been some, some stock turnover in housing and I think that's going to continue, uh, particularly as the housing market is strong and you know people are getting good um, uh, good sale uh, prices for their homes. And the impact of uh, some of the multifamily housing projects that have... Yeah, the multifamily is probably phase two. So yeah. that would be the second biggest. The um, the projects in particular on Littleton Road mm -hmm. at this point have really impacted uh, Biome. You know, Biome has yes. been <laughs> operating. Um, our schools are basically designed to have like four grade levels. Um, I'm sorry, four classes at each grade level. But Biome has had to actually expand to five. Um, so they're what we consider a five-strand school now instead of a four, just because of the extra numbers of students. So mm -hmm. they have five kindergartens, five first grades, five second grades, where the schools were really just originally intended to be fours. So you would have four first grades. You know, it's funny grades. because, uh, believe it or not, uh, I had that conversation with my middle granddaughter, Violet, who was in grade four at Byam. And I said, okay. Violet, how many uh, fourth grades are there? She says, four. No, no, five. Right. She said, yeah. she, you know, she had to think for right. a second. No, there's, there's five across right. the board at Byam. Yeah. And what we would oftentimes have, because Chelmsford has always enrolled by neighborhood. Uh, yes. So if you live in a certain geography in town, you go to a certain elementary school. Or now mm -hmm. it doesn't matter at the middle school level, but that's how it used to be. And um, unless we were to look at some kind of a complete shuffle and like mm -hmm. a rezoning and different way of doing the enrollment, if we maintain that way, from time to time we will get what we call a bubble class. So at uh, South Row, for the first time, they happen to have just a large number of students in a particular grade level, this is um, two years ago, mm -hmm. enroll. So we had to add a fifth section of a particular grade level. Let's say it was first grade at the time. Well, we watched that bubble kind of go up through elementary school, mm -hmm. so they may have five first grades this year. They're going to have five second grades and five third and five fourth. Makes sense. And then they kind of go out. We were able to budget for that and accommodate it and really still keep our class sizes um, relatively um, um, attainable what we want to attain. Um, but I am again has pretty consistently been five across the board. Mm -hmm. um, center, when the hotels used to be used a little bit more for um, housing some homeless populations, mm -hmm. um, they would obviously be zoned to center. So we actually had a yes. few years where we had to add some classrooms at center. So we'll do that to kind of keep up with um, bubbles of enrollment, mm -hmm. but we're actually, this isn't a bubble. So this is actually an enrollment increase of about uh, 600 kids over the next 10 years. Amazing. And we need to get ready for that. Yes. So that's that was part of our reason for the uh, potential new school building project. Well, uh, I, I'll just have to tell you that Violet's thrilled because uh, she informed me that in the pods they have air conditioning. They have air conditioning. So she's very happy They have their that. own bathrooms out yes. there. Yes. <laughs> They're really, it's like a self-contained little community out there. But So that's um, done That's done well. Yeah. So, uh, well, let's lead into what you were just alluding to. I mean, obviously, uh, a lot of these things that have been planned out uh, it's not just uh, let's get through the next week. I mean, right. You, 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 and your staff have been thinking 
long term, which right. is not a particularly American trait. So congratulations no, thank for that. You. you have to yeah, do it. No, you, you exactly. You know, we tend to be short-term people right. in this country, but right. this is good. So you, you've always had the eye on the prize, uh, which is um, getting acceptance into the school building needs uh, right. program. So let's talk a little bit about that and uh, where we are in that process and what you envision maybe five, six years out. Sure. So a few years back, we actually started because we came to the realization that we were likely going to need some additional school space. We didn't know at what grade level we'd want to pursue. If you remember originally, we actually thought about a new high school. Yes. And if we had built a new high school, then we could merge the two middle schools and the current high school. Everyone would get a newer building. We tried the high school application for three years and ultimately were unsuccessful, largely because of the age of our high school competing against the other high schools or the other communities who are putting a high school forward. So it all uh, with the MSBA, it's all based on a community's need, the uh, age of the building, is it upkept, is it dilapidated? And Chelmsford has done a very good job of maintaining their high school. Yeah, no which good I, deed goes unpunished, no, folks. I know, right? but in, in the high school is ironically our newest building. You know, yeah, I, in 74. I know. Amazing, isn't it? Everything else yeah. is from the 50s and 60s. So um, we just realized after the three years that wasn't going to work. And again, this enrollment issue is not going away. So we had to you know, kind of pivot a little bit and figure out how we might else um, look at this. And we had a group come back in, work with us again. And ultimately, what we decided on is potentially a new middle school project for Chelmsford. Um, and we applied to the MSBA. It took us two years, but last year we were um, approved to enter into what they call an eligibility period. Mm -hmm. So that allows us to go through a whole um, uh, exercise of looking at our existing schools. Um, would you do a new school? Would you do a renovation? Would you look at grade level realignments or readjustments? And again, I kind of had the foresight that if we were going to be doing this to make that application clean, because obviously there's a lot of community input and debate that'll go into this, you want to take out as many variables as you can. Mm -hmm. So if we hadn't split the two middle schools at that time, then you also would have had the debate about, well, should we do the middle schools exactly. split? Shouldn't we have? So we kind of got that off the table. And with Parker now serving just five, six, and McCarthy serving just seven, eight, we were able to make a more compelling argument for Parker being the potential uh, new school building. Mm -hmm. And again, with that's five, six, that is one of the options we'll look at, just a brand new five, six. But we also got approved to look at a new grade four, five, six. And again, what that would allow us to do is take a grade level out of the elementary schools in a brand new building. Um, everyone in the town would benefit from that because we also wanted to make sure we didn't have you haves and have not situation in town. And that would then take about 100 to 125 kids out of our mm -hmm. elementary mm -hmm. schools, which again, Perfect. for 10 or 20 years, helps us as far as uh, enrollment at the elementary level. So in one project, we can actually serve elementary needs and middle school needs and our high school has plenty of capacity. Mm -hmm. So we know that there's not a capacity issue with the high school. So we did systematically kind of look at this and figure out, you know, how could we make the most compelling argument, not only to um, the town, because the town has to support mm -hmm. us, but the state would uh, participate in this project and pay approximately 52% of the cost. Oh. So nice. a new school building is going to be expensive, but if we were to go it alone, then you know it's going to be twice as expensive mm -hmm. as if we did it with the uh, state partnership. So that's something we're exploring at this point. So we've been approved, so let's assume things go uh, as we would like them to go. So what are we talking about in terms of uh, time before we get a shovel in the ground? So uh, town meeting was, mm -hmm. uh, again, super supportive this April. They actually already approved our feasibility right. study agreement. So. We're doing all the paperwork now. We would ultimately go forward at the January 2025, this coming January mm -hmm. board meeting for the MSBA to be invited into what they call um, feasibility. In uh, feasibility, you would then hire your project manager and your designer to take a look at um, what would be involved, where it would go, size, things along those lines. That takes about 18 months. So that puts you in the summer of 26, where in the fall of 26, you'd likely be doing a ballot initiative with mm -hmm. the town to get uh, support for your new school. Um, then you need about a, you know, nine months to a year to get mm -hmm. all of your design documents and everything together. So you may be breaking ground in the um, fall, spring of 27, and then potentially opening a new middle school if everything goes well around 2030 to 31. So okay. it, it is a good, you know, still six years away. I, I, might, you, I might make it. Oh, you're going to make it. <laughs> uh, but you actually, you do have to be thinking that long term because yes. it does take you, uh, take you that long to do that. 
and I, I love a, a school building project, so this is something that uh, I'd really be interested in kind of seeing through. Um, well, you went through it in Lowell. I did, yeah. Yes. I, I got to participate in a few different yeah. builds in Lowell, and uh, I very much enjoyed that piece of the work. Um, I would love to work with uh, Chelmsford on a project. Well, I'll tell you, uh, I think it's something that we're all looking forward to, and most of us are very interested in maintaining the quality of our education in the town, and, and uh, we're very glad to have you at the helm. And, Jay, the half hour goes Did it go fast. by already? We are out of time. Well, so uh, we will have you back. Uh, it won't be a year. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you for having me tonight oh, you're as very well. very welcome. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. All good information. Thank you, Sam.